for joining us online again today. I extend the shine and glory of Jesus to you today. Welcome to our worship, where you and your spiritual journey are always welcome. Please join us as we start our time together with our opening song. Peace and joy of Christ be with us all. We are glad that you are with us and we invite you to make your presence known by leaving a comment on Facebook or messaging or emailing Pastor Rich. I give thanks and praise that during this time of this pandemic, we continue to be the church. Thank you for your support and please continue your commitment of tithes and offerings to this faith community. Consider setting up an MCCQC monthly bill pay through your online banking, or you can mail your giving to the church office. Thank you for whatever you can do. At MCCQC, our offering plates are always full of people. Praise God. Also, please send us an email with your email address so that we can stay in touch and send the weekly prayer list with information and inspiration. On that list, you're gonna find a special um, little workshop that um, Pastor and I have designed. And I invite you to pay attention to the date for that because neither one of us can quite remember it right now. <laughs> but we know it's sometime in July and it will be done virtually um, through Zoom. So look for the details but of course you won't get those unless you send us your email so we can send that out to you. LGBTQ history. One second, I think. From awesome. the beginning. Join us for our virtual social time at noon every Sunday on Zoom meeting ID number 835-8636-0906. 
That information will appear again on the slide at the end of the service. Prayer is an important part of who we are as MCCQC. Let us continue our time together by joining our hearts and minds in prayer. Holy moly, holy smokes, holy black, Islamic, gay, trans, large, small, differently abled, addicted, homeless, young, and old, God, help us remember there is no other. God, we pause to consider who you are and what you care about. Like a four-year-old, we keep asking lots of why questions, when we should be asking how can I questions. We thank you that your love loves no matter what. Show us how to love like that. Shelter us when we are bitter and angry and haven't got the strength to rise above the voices of negativity, the voices of guilt, the demons in our own head. Teach us, O oh Lord, how to be gentle with ourselves. Give us the strength to say the words, I'm sorry. The words, please help me. And the words, I forgive you. Thank you for the miracles, big and small, all around us, and especially for the people in our lives who care. Thank you for those angels with skin on them. Thank you for sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Keep us grounded in our senses, yet willing to be mysteriously transported in your spirit. Remind us that we are naked, yet help us to be unafraid. Give us this day our daily comeuppance so that we can learn from our mistakes. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And now, friends here and at home, for what else shall we pray? Shall miss it. I can't find that little girl to say. The Ramsey Moody's. Ernest Moody's. Ernest Moody's. Thank you. Thank you, holy God of many names, for loving us, warts and scars and all. Amen.
Hear this reading from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12, and 23 through 24. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where could I go from your spirit, or where could I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall come over me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Here ends that reading. Please rise, whether in body or spirit, as you are able, and hear this good news reading from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. The words of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the householder said, an enemy has done this. The servants asked, then do you want us to go and gather them? But the householder replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus explained, the one who sows the good seed is the child of humanity. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. At the end, the righteous will shine like the sun. Please be seated. There's an old Texas joke that says the best way to garden is to put on a wide brim straw hat and some old clothes and with a hoe in one hand and a cold drink in the other, tell somebody else where to dig. <laughs> Doug Larson says, a weed is a plant that has mastered every survival skill except for learning how to grow in rows. And always remember, if your joints are stiff, you're probably rolling them too tight. <laughs> Let us pray. God of the other, help us remember there is no other. Only us, God of all. Amen. Amen. Can Jesus be any clearer? It is not our place to judge between the weeds and the wheat. It is not our place to make sure the weeds are mowed down or plucked up. Now, this doesn't apply to death, who weeds our garden, by the way. <laughs> Once again, if we think in terms of weeds and our own gardens, Jesus shows himself to be a very, very poor at farming and gardening. But once again, that's not what Jesus is really talking about, is it? 
Jesus is talking about our ability to live in the world alongside of evil and evil people. Tares is the word that was used, and it describes a very specific plant. Tares are the weed that was purposely sown by the evildoers for a reason. Because when green, tares look almost identical to wheat. Tares are in fact a poisonous ripeness. But when the wheat ripens at the end, it becomes obvious which is the wheat and which are the tares. Just like the Bible says, you will know them by their fruits. Now, some of you are like me, fixers. We want to fix things. We want to make things right. And it works great when our children are toddlers and all you have to do is kiss a knee or a boo-boo. It doesn't work so well trying to fix things for an adult child. Instead, all we can do is listen and be patient and wait. And very much like trusting in God. Listen, be patient, and wait. So we have to learn to deal with the terrorists, not terrorists, terrorists, weed people in our lives. But we may need to deal with them in loving ways so that we don't become terrorists ourselves. Because for every terrorist in your life, there's someone who thinks that you are the terrorist. And if that's the case, you're probably not doing things right. And none of us do it all right. We're not perfect. The kingdom of God on earth is messy. It's a mixed field where good and bad stuff and people are so intermingled that it's not safe or good for us to try to separate them with our own limited wisdom and vision. A vision that only sees through a mirror dimly in this life. We don't like messy ambiguity. We don't like, we'd rather say who's in and who's out. Or we want to draw lines in the sand. The problem with drawing lines in the sand is that in immediately trying tear out those tears, we draw that line that actually is drawing ourselves outside of God's gracious heart. In trying to tear out the terrorists, we may actually be uprooting ourselves. As someone once humorously said, I'm certain there will be three surprises in heaven. I will see some people there I never expected to see, there will be a number of people missing whom I expected to be there, and there will be others who will be surprised to see me there. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. In other words, the bad news, good news of the reign of God is that God started down the road of freedom and love a long time ago, and God will not turn back from that path of freedom, free will, and love for everyone. Freedom, as we learn every day in the flawed workings of American democracy, for example, is a messy business. It takes patience and trust. It's not about blind faith. It's about having faith and standing up for what we do believe in. And we see the same in God's running of the world. God takes the risk of not being too hasty in the weeding process. I'm sure many of you have the experience that I've had of conscientiously pulling up something and later finding out that that wasn't a weed. <laughs> God's justice seems to take a long time because God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, as Psalm 86 reminds us. The truth of the matter, though, is that God's patient mercy drives us crazy at times. Except, that is, when we need and want God to be patient with us and our sins. <laughs> then it's not so bad, right, that God is patient and slow to anger and all that. 
The truth that Jesus reveals in this parable is hard for us to accept because God is telling us something we really don't want to hear. When we encounter what we see as evil, our immediate reaction is to want to go on a hunt and destroy mission. Our battle cry becomes, don't just stand there, do something! And sometimes that's not what we're called to do. Now those of you who know me know that I am not one of these um, complete Zen persons that says, you know, it's all God's will and so there's nothing we can do about the way the world is. It's not that God expects us to stand still and do nothing when we're confronted with evil. But what we have to do is not become evil ourselves, and that's the real danger. So in the process of talking to someone who we see as, as perfectly evil, we have to remember that within them is still the possibility of love, and to not attack them, but to attack the evil. It's a difficult thing to do. Like I said, life's messy. In this parable, Jesus turns conventional wisdom on its head. And Jesus has the landowner say, in effect, don't just do something, stand there. And sometimes that's what we need to do. Don't just do something, stand there. Wait. Jesus is teaching us the important lesson that we are called as his disciples not just to be against things, but to be for things, to be for the good that God will cause to prosper and grow as we wait with trusting patience and mercy. It is all about patience, but it's not roll over dead patience. It's not head in the sand patience, but an active, patient waiting that concentrates on the good and not on the bad. That's one of the things that really makes me angry about the political ads today. I mean, that's on both sides. All they do is emphasize the negative on the other person. They don't tell us, what do you stand for? Who are you? What are you about? And some of them do. But most of the ads are just negative ads. And like me, I'm sure you're very tired of hearing about them. It doesn't help matters. Active patience trusts in the ultimate victory that is God's, and that the power of God's antidote to the good news, antidote of the good news in Christ Jesus is far stronger than the poison of the tares, the bad seeds. In short, how we live among the weeds, among the tares, is vital. It is vital that we live as patient, forgiving disciples because while weeds always remain weeds, and wheat always remains wheat in the natural world, in God's spiritual agricultural world, God never writes anyone off. So while we may think it's a tear, tears in God's world can turn into wheat. People can change under the power of God's mercy as the example of the repentant thief on the cross shows us, and as we know from personal experience. So the default setting for us is not to be terrorists, but to deal with terrorists patiently and with forgiveness. Some biblical scholars have pointed out the perhaps intentional linguistic hint of the connection to forgiveness in verse 30. When the landowner tells the servants to allow the wheat and the tares to grow up together, the original Greek for allow is the same word used as forgive in the Lord's Prayer. To forgive as we have been forgiven. Imagine that. You've taken the care to make sure that you had the right seeds. You toiled, you planted them. And someone wickedly sowed weeds in your field. And Jesus is telling us, yep, even them, we have to forgive. It's hard medicine. 
but we have to forgive as we have been forgiven. To not practice forgiveness is to run the risk of becoming just like the evil that we are trying to uproot and remove. A proverb says, choose your enemies carefully because you become like them. How true. It is so easy to become intolerant with intolerant people, or angry at people who are angry at us, or bigoted towards bigoted people. By seeking to destroy our enemies, we usually condemn ourselves because we have become just like them. As another proverb says, be careful lest in fighting the dragon you become the dragon. You know, we think we want, we're going to be dragon slayers, but the world doesn't need dragon slayers. The world needs love, needs menders, needs people to make things right. And it's a lot easier to tear something down than it is to build something, right? But that's what we need to be as builders. Michener, in one of his first novels called The Fires of Spring, tells about a couple who are burdened with a load of guilt from their past, and they wander into a Quaker meeting. And if you know anything about the Quakers, the Quakers, they don't have creatures like we do. They sit, and when and if someone feels moved by God to say something, they stand up and say something. So the couple sits with the others for what seems like hours to them, because most people aren't used to just sitting. They're waiting for something to happen. And finally, an elderly man stands up and speaks, and he says, the most misleading concept in religion is that of the recording angel. I cannot believe that God cares to remember and make a big deal out of any single incident in our lives. Rather, I am the recording angel. My spirit and my body are the record. My good deeds show in me and my wrong deeds aren't hidden either. My spirit either grows to fullness or declines to nothing. God has no need of recording devices. We must not think of God as a vengeful or shopkeeping dictograph. God has created a better instrument. God has made me. God needs only look at me, and all is recorded. And I really, really love that passage because we're so tuned into thinking that, that God is up there with a magic scorecard, you know, and he's making the tally marks for rights and wrongs. When that's, Jesus tells us that's not how God works at all. The old man goes on to conclude that with God's permission, we have the privilege of erasing our past mistakes. God offers us redemption the opportunity to start fresh and make our lives useful by forgiving our past sin and opening our lives to new wisdom. Do not let the seeds get in the way of your own glory. You were meant to shine in the sunlight. So shine. I was musing on the lyrics to Landslide this week. They were born when Stevie Nicks of Fleetwood Mac was faced with the fear of losing everything for a dream. I was tired of being poor, she writes, and I was tired of being a waitress. She recalls that she and Lindsay Buckingham only had enough money for food, and living in poverty put a big strain on their relationship. Landslide is about the fear of everything coming crashing down and not knowing how you're going to hold things together in pursuit of a dream. Landside, the fear, is palpable in the song. But the story of the song is, look what wonderful music and lives Stevie Nicks and Fleetwood Mac and their dreams produced. I took my love, I took it down, climbed a mountain and I turned around and I saw my own reflection in the snow-covered hills. So the landslide brought me down. O oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? Can the child within my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing ocean tides? Can I handle the seasons of my own life? Mm. Well, 
I've been afraid of changing because I've built my life around you. But time makes you bolder. Even children get older. And I'm getting older too. Have you seen your reflection in a snow-covered hill? What is your dream? Don't let the weeds get in the way of shining in your glory. Holy One, show us the miracle of love, the miracles of coexistence. Gather us in your arms, as together we pray in the manner Jesus taught his own disciples to pray. Our Creator, Our Creator in, in heaven and all, all around us, holy is your name. name. Your, your kingdom come, your will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive, forgive us our sins, sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the good news. Our God is a God of love and forgiveness who runs to meet you with open arms. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I don't understand how God works. I certainly don't understand the whys of a lot of things. But I have learned to trust and to love. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, 
broke it and gave it to his friend, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I tell you now, take these broken wings and learn to fly again. Let love in and learn to soar. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave thanks, and offered it to his friends, including Judas Iscariot, and said, this is my love poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. Holy One, bless these simple offerings in the many ways we receive and celebrate them in our diversity or fail to understand them at all. Whatever we have at home, a morsel, a car, a drop of water, a coffee. Bless it, God. Bless it all. May they strengthen us, soul food for our spiritual journeys. In the name of Jesus, the forgiver, the joy giver. Amen. Amen. All are welcome to receive what is offered you here today. And for those of you at home, your meal is blessed as well. Let us pray. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that we have received, and thank you for all that is yet to come. We ask your blessings upon it in the name of Jesus, the joy giver. Amen. Amen. Please rise, whether in body or spirit, as you are able for our closing hymn. Yay, Jesus!